Good evening and welcome to the symposium at Cardiff Castle. Tonight's talk is entitled Extinguishing the Fire, Our War Against Terrorism. And we have the distinguished scholar, Sheikh Hamza Youssef from the USA. The hosts for this evening are two parties. One is the Wales Islamic Network Group, and the other is the All Wales Sahali Association. Ladies and gentlemen, can you please put your hands together for Sheikh Hamza Youssef. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, and prayers and peace be upon our Prophet and all the Prophets. I would first like to say that it's indeed an honor to be here. That goes without saying, in fact. And it certainly is an extraordinary place for us to convene and to talk about this subject uh, in a castle, because in essence what we are trying to do is deal with an assault on civil society. And I also think it's interesting that I was described as a man on fire when in fact my talk is about extinguishing fires. So I think it's also quite pertinent because somebody who is on fire uh, wants to put the fire out as quickly as possible because selfishness is obviously one of the most important factors that we have going for us if we utilize it correctly and as it should be. To give you an example, I asked a good friend of mine from Cardiff, he's a Welshman, I asked him, is there anything that you'd like to be brought up because I'm going to be talking to some very important people in Welsh society? And he said, yes, there is something, and I consider it the most important thing on the agenda. And I asked him what that was, and he said, to tell them to stop the domain project on Mandy Street. And if nobody knows what that project is, it's a housing project. And he went on to explain to me that it was going to ruin his view. And he said not only was the council against it, but all the people were against it. And he said so the government should be against it as well. And I think what that illustrates to me is that people tend to think about themselves I and mean, I really think that that's at the root of what is motivating so many of us. And the people that we consider to be saintly individuals are often people that are willing to sacrifice themselves for others, selfless work. And even the cynics among us would say that that, in fact, is nothing other than what we call the hedonistic principle, and that is that by serving others, we ourselves, in fact, get some enjoyment or comfort. So there's certain people that actually that's how they derive their pleasure so these are arguments just about human behavior, that much of what is motivating us is, in fact, a type of selfishness. Well, there's also a sense of what one of the greatest Islamic historians, and in fact, in some ways called the father of modern history, Ibn Khaldun, explained another type of mechanism that is motivating people, and that's what's known as asabiyah. He called it asabiyah. And this is the esprit de corps that exists within societies. It's a group feeling. It's that thing that unites us in our efforts to do what we're doing. So societies that are successful have stronger group feelings, according to Ibn Khaldun. Now, obviously, group feeling can become extreme. And I think Nazi Germany is one of the best examples of the type of group feeling that ends up destroying the society instead of helping the society. And this is something for Welsh society that's very interesting because I think there is an attempt in modern Welsh society to restore a sense of identity of the Welsh people as an indigenous people. I mean, I've, I find it really interesting that, that uh, Wellius, when I read a little history of Wales, actually meant in Anglo-Saxon foreigners. And I thought it was very interesting that the invaders should call the indigenous people foreigners. I think that that, unfortunately, is one of the real problems that we have going is often people that are doing things to harm other people will often use certain techniques and turn it around. So occupiers are called liberators. I mean, this is what Napoleon, when he occupied Egypt, he told the Egyptians that we're coming to liberate you. We're not coming to occupy you. In fact, he actually said that I'm coming to teach you the true Quran. I and mean, this is what he told the scholars of Al-Azhar. So we have this esprit de corps that exists if taken to an extreme, uh, becomes actually quite harmful and dangerous, but is somewhat necessary for us to have a sense 
of solidarity, that we're working for some common effort. Now, if we look at the people in the West, I think one of the things that we tend to forget and is very important in the Quranic narrative is to look at history. One of the things that the Quran says is travel in the land and look at what came of the peoples that went before you. In other words, study the past, that you might learn the lessons of the past. And there are historians that have said the only lesson we seem to learn from the past is that we learn nothing from the past. Arnold Toynbee studied 21 uh, civilizations and, and came to the conclusion that they all followed the same patterns. And what ultimately brought them to destruction were the very same uh, things that were common to all of these civilizations. That knowledge, it would seem we would be empowered by it. It would seem that we would try to utilize that knowledge to actually forestall, to attempt to stop what seems inevitable in societies. But I think much of what has happened in the past we fail to learn from. If you look at the, the West, we have been through extraordinary revolutions and those revolutions were brought about largely to change certain social orders that people were not happy with. I mean, we forget that we actually have ancestors. I mean, I come from largely a, a Scottish background and a northern uh, English background. And we forget that those people fought wars to basically live in dignity, to basically ensure just wages, ensure just hours, to break certain ideas that were very common in that time, the divine right of kings, that somebody had a right to rule from God. And those were broken with much bloodshed. Well, if you look at large segments of the world, the revolutionary period that was what's so bloody has, in fact, either been aborted or bypassed entirely. If you look at the Arab world, for instance, there was a revolutionary period. But the revolutionary period in the Arab world was so dictated, despotic models, that when the revolutionaries actually succeeded, for instance, in Algeria with Bembella and uh, Boumedien, when they actually succeeded, they in turn created the same despotic models that they had overthrown. And the same in Egypt with Jamal Abdel Nasser, uh, the great socialist revolutionary that so many of the Arabs tied their hopes on. In other ways, uh, things were aborted like in Iran, the democratic election of Mossadegh that was overthrown in a coup that was largely planned and financed from the United Kingdom and from the United States during Eisenhower's administration. So we, as a collective group of people, have inherited historical baggage. Some of that baggage we've never bothered to open up and actually look inside. We just carry it around like dead weights. And we don't realize that what is enervating us, what's dissipating our energies, is that very baggage. And so in looking at it, in examining it, we have an immense amount to learn. And that is one of the messages of the Quran, is to really look. Now, for Wales in particular, I would say that you are in a unique situation vis-a-vis -vis the minority communities in this country. One of the aspects that really impresses me about this culture here is that you do not have a history of colonialism. In fact, quite the opposite. You have a history of being colonized rather than colonizing. And therefore, there is no real reason for any other peoples to have any animosity towards you because historically, people inherit animosity. If you look at the Jewish and the Arab situation now, I mean, this is largely programmed. It's programmed hate. Jewish children are taught to hate Arabs. Arab children are taught to hate Jews. And the animosities are recreated with each generation because of certain programmings. Those programmings are never really questioned. We're never really looking at, are all Jews bad? Are all Arabs bad? Because I think most rational people, if they actually think about statements like that, they obviously come to the conclusion that not only are they absurd, but they're actually deeply destructive. So this is the type of baggage that people inherit. Now, for Welsh uh, people, you don't have that problem. You really don't. Not only that, unlike the Canadians, who have trouble with their indigenous peoples because there are people that came to Canada and essentially took land from other people. And my country is also a country like that. I mean, it's a little difficult for the United States to talk about the Israeli occupation of areas in Palestine if you accept the 47 or even the entire state as most Arabs look at it. 
as occupation. It's a little difficult for them to do that when we still have indigenous peoples that are demanding lands that were taken from them unconstitutionally. I'm talking about peoples like the Cherokee Nation and the Lakota Nation. So America itself was based upon taking land from people that those people still consider it unjust appropriation of their lands. But the Welsh, don't, you don't have that problem. This is your land. I think that that says an immense amount for, for what you can do. That, that in, in essence, is a type of goodwill that you have been given by your ancestors, by the peoples that went before you. And that's something that you can take out and extend to the communities here. Now, if we look at terrorism today, I mean, the first thing, the war on terrorism, I have a problem with for a number of reasons. One, I don't think it's ever been properly defined. In fact, the United States does not have an official definition of terrorism. The FBI has a definition, the CIA has a definition, the State Department has a definition, and if you look at them, they are not the same. And it's very easy to use their definitions of terrorism in the, in the various nuances to actually attack any type of resistance, any type of rebellion, whether legitimate or illegitimate, in defense of people's rights, in defense of their lands, etc. So I think that that, in essence, is a problem. We have failed to really identify that. But I think if we could look at two aspects of the problem of terrorism, one is obviously state terrorism, and the other is vigilante terrorism. State terrorism involves the use of weapons of mass destruction or otherwise against civilians. And we have, for instance, in many places on the world today, we have peoples that live in a state of terror because of the threat either of, of the use of weapons against them or because of actual aggression that's occurring at any given time. If you look at the real central problem that we have here, though, I would say it's obviously use of vigilante terrorism. Now, in Islamic law, it is absolutely prohibited for individuals to take the law into their own hands. But part of the problem in the Muslim world is that there has been a marginalization of Islamic scholars to such a degree that they have had almost entirely no access to educating their populations. Their own institutions have been so neglected. And in the areas where state religion is supported in certain countries, certain strains of Islam that are not normative but in a sense are actually considered extreme in reality are the ones that are, have been encouraged in the past, although that's beginning to change. So the Muslim world in itself has immense problems from the very top to the very bottom. I mean, you have deep-seated social problems in the Muslim world. Now, here in the West, how can we, what can we do to alleviate those problems? I think essentially one of the things that we can do is recognize that these, if we continue to treat the branches or the bitter fruit of these problems and not go to the root of the problems, they're not going to go away. And I think Ireland is a good example of that. If you look at the problems in Ireland with Irish terrorism, it wasn't until certain issues were truly addressed that the situation began to change. And I think that in the Muslim world, if it's going to be an eradication of individuals, of groups, what will continue to happen is that you will continue to find young people seeing this as a tax on their culture, on their society. I mean, this is what I feel. And when I actually met with uh, President Bush, one of the things that I said was that my biggest fear is that if the Muslims themselves are not brought on board to fight this problem, that you're going to get a polarization in the Muslim world. And the Muslims are going to see themselves as once again being the victims of a crusade, a religious crusade. And it's, I mean, this is what is happening. If you look at Iraq, Iraq has succeeded in again politicizing many, many Muslim youth. If you look, for instance, at the RAND report, which is an attempt to understand the Muslim world, uh, the RAND report suggests, for instance, presenting secularism as a counterculture to Arab youth so that they can rebel by becoming secular as opposed to becoming religion. I mean, these are the type of solutions that are being offered to the highest levels of state in the Arab world. And I think that this, in essence, is a tragedy. 
that instead of going to the root problems, and I would say if we look at root problems, I would say first and foremost, one of the gravest problems that we have is the fact that we have allowed certain aspects in the Muslim world to continue on for so long, the promotion of despotic governments in order to sustain the interest, the national interests of Great Britain, of France, of Germany, of the United States. So despotic models have been allowed to continue on. And now, changing horses in midstream, suddenly the Arabs are being told that we're going to bring you democracy. Well, the Native Americans have a saying, white man speaks with forked tongue. And this is part of the problem is that the hypocrisy in the past has been so great because this has been told in the past that people have lost any sense of credibility. I mean, this is how so much of the Muslim world now views us. I think in reality in the West have failed to truly appreciate the degree to which the Muslims really feel that the West is responsible for so many of their problems. It's very easy for people like Farid Zakaria to say that the Muslims need to get over that. But the truth is the interventions that have been going on, the amount of wealth that has been coming out of the Muslim world in terms of oil and otherwise, and the lack of actually giving anything back by supporting the governments that in turn end up sending all of the money back to the West. And I'll give you one example. The seventh largest purchaser of arms in the world is Saudi Arabia. So the very wealth, the oil wealth, that brings so much money into the Middle East, that wealth is in fact being recycled back into the West. So in fact, very little is actually being given to the people in the end. And so many of the people there, I think the political uh, nature of the Middle East and of Pakistan and India is so much greater the political environment that people live in. People are deeply engaged in politics in those places. They talk about politics constantly. I mean, it's, all, it's an obsession, really, in the Middle East. Here, where we live in reasonably civic societies, and things tend to, in some ways, move along, and we do quite well, people tend to fall asleep, be more concerned about football matches and who won this game and who won that game than the real matters that concern societies. That is not the case in large parts of the world. These people are very politicized and really struggling with these issues day in and day out because they feel them and they experience them. And so I think that we here have an immense responsibility, I think, to show more goodwill instead of constantly berating these people and attacking these people for their inabilities, for their incapacity to change their situations, to actually extend to them this hand of goodwill. And I would give you a very profound example of this in the past. And I think this castle reflects an immense amount of Islamic influence for anybody that studied the Renaissance and the sources of much of this type of design and architecture. The Muslims gave an immense amount to Europe during what is called the Renaissance. And there is only one example that I know of of a society that really tried to give back, and that was Sicily. There was a period of about 100 years in which the Christians of Sicily were not only offering asylum and an immense amount of toleration and support of their Islamic communities, but there was so much mutual benefit that that knowledge actually uh, became a major source of the Italian Renaissance. And so there is an immense amount that people here can do. There's an immense amount of goodwill that can be shown. And I think that this room here, the people in this room, the intelligence in this room, the influence in this room, I think that you yourselves can do an immense amount here in Wales. And, and now I really like to look at a few things. One, the second major problem that I have with terrorism is that I do not believe in any way that it is really, in the light of other threats, is a major threat to us. Martin Rees, who's the Astronomer Royal in Cambridge, has written a book called The Last Century, in which he feels that this 21st century might very well be the last century of humanity because of what we're being now confronted with in terms of catastrophes. That's hard information for us to absorb. How do we process that? How do we process, for instance, that 90% of the waters 
that human beings, fish, have been depleted in the last 20 years. How do we process that? And yet I heard that confirmed. I read it originally in The Guardian and then heard it confirmed by a oceanologist in, in uh, Boston. How do, how do we process that? It's very difficult to process. How do we process the fact that 50 million people now are being faced with death in Africa from AIDS? How do we process the fact that the United States is spending 0.13% of its gross national product on aid, and yet it's spending 51% of its tax dollar on the military-industrial complex? How do we deal with the fact that 50% of our scientists are working in defense in the United States. I mean, if we have such immense problems as a human community now that we are facing, that we need to really recognize that our energies need to be directed towards those problems. They need to be directed towards those problems. And that's going to take courage. It's going to take courage from politicians that recognize that it can't be business as usual. I mean, that, we, that the social problems that we are confronted with have to be addressed at the deepest levels. If they are not, I mean, I believe that this generation is going to be a defining generation for future generations because we are now confronted with elements that we've never been confronted with before. The proliferation of technology has enabled individuals to inflict the harm that pre-modern armies were not capable of inflicting. So nuclear weapons, the proliferation of these weapons, and now the possibility of dirty bombs and suitcases, where is this all leading to? I think it's going to eventually erode the civil liberties in these societies that the very things that our ancestors fought to ensure that we might have are going to disappear slowly or quickly. And so I really feel that looking and addressing the real issues. And in this country, I know that one of the major issues that you're confronted with is race. And I would remind you that Arnold Toynbee said, if we do not solve the race problem, and he said this in 1947, if we do not solve the race problem, then I fear that the militant spirit of Islam will once again be awakened, even if it slept, like the companions of the cave for 300 years, the militant spirit of Islam will be awakened and it will challenge this minority that has for so long been controlling large parts of the wealth of the earth and not sharing them with other parts of the world. And I think that that is really one of the greatest dangers that we're facing is that the Muslims now the resentment has built up to such a degree that you're dealing with a rage element. There will be a fire, and it might be to a degree that we won't be able to extinguish it. And I don't mean to say that in any threatening way, but in a, real, a really sincere way, in a warning, because I've lived amongst the Muslims and I've seen the type of resentment. And Nietzsche reminded us in the last century that resentment was a ticking time bomb in the human self. And so I think that what we need to do is diffuse this resentment. And the only way that can be done is by goodwill. And I really, truly believe this. I believe that human beings have an immense capacity to forgive. I think they have an immense capacity to forgive. But there must be an apology. There must be a recognition that they have been wronged, that they have been harmed. And I think just in simply doing that, and I asked one of the advisors to Tony Blair, just to simply send that message that if we would truly just admit that people have suffered and just look at their suffering in a real way, I think that that admittance alone would do so much to diffuse a lot of the, the built-up resentment and rage. And I think a lot of these young people here who have come to these countries, migrated to these countries, their fathers or their grandfathers brought them to these countries, and they were born into these countries, not of their own choosing, but they have come here and they want to be part of these societies. But if that hand of friendship is not offered to them in some sincere way, without looking on them with contempt, without seeing them as less than you, without seeing them somehow as, as people that are tainted by their genetics or by their color, 
And of all people on these islands, I think the Welsh people, the Irish people, are more capable of recognizing that because of their own treatment in the past. So I really feel that if you extend your hand to these people, that you're going to see immense things. And I would hope that this country here, Wales, become a model for Europe. I really think that you can become a model in race relations and in social work that you would be proud of and that you can in turn extend to other peoples. So I would really hope that you take serious the indigenous community. If we want to extinguish the fire of terrorism, I think the first thing that we have to do is recognize that we have kindling in our own societies. And it needs to be recognized and it needs to be addressed. And these are the disenfranchised youth of these societies, of the United Kingdom, of Wales, of Scotland. It's not the Arabs now that have come here, the Omar Bakris and the Abu Hamzas. It's, it's the Saeeds and the Abdallahs that are growing up in Manchester, in Bradford, in Leeds, in Glasgow, and here in Cardiff. And I think that these youth, they need to be given hope. They need to be given visions of possibility. And so I would just end by, by saying, I mean, I, I've, I've kept this rather broad, and I think that, you know, above all, just coming together and allowing this opportunity for a Muslim who is also an American, and I really do feel in some ways I grew up in the best of the Western tradition. My father was a humanities teacher, and then I went to the Muslim world, and I studied their tradition and came to love that tradition, and I'm devoted to that tradition without abandoning my own tradition, and I don't see them as mutually exclusive. I believe that the best that we have in the West is in essence contained and crystallized in the Islamic teaching. I think the very principles that we have, those ideals that we hold the highest, those are the same ideals that the Muslims adhere to as well. And I think that there is immense possibility for conciliation, immense possibility for conviviality, but it's going to take an immense effort from ourselves. And I really feel that as human beings, we have proven ourselves in the past of addressing the problems and surmounting them. And I think we're capable of doing it today, but it's going to need a lot of work. One of the ways in which I'm trying to do that is to start, we founded a seminary in California that is attempting to train indigenous Muslim scholars that are here to be productive members and not destructive members of society. And I would love to see that in Wales. I would love to see an Islamic seminary. And I've told them that I hope to be part of that, to help them develop that. And I think that we can train from Wales. We can train young men and women uh, in the true Islamic tradition, which is a tradition of peace. It's a tradition of concord and harmony. And it's a tradition that I believe that we in the West can still learn an immense amount from. And I would just end this by, I was reminded of the poem by Robert Frost in which he said that uh, some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. And I think that these two destructive elements on the planet, desire, greed, and hate and resentment, if we don't seriously take them seriously and overcome them, uh, they will be our downfall. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sheikh Hamza. That was as uh, awe-inspiring and exactly on the spot as we thought it would be. It's also very exciting to hear that uh, Sheikh Hamza is exploring the establishment of, of a Zaytuna Institute, which is the institute he runs and founded in California over here in Wales. I think that would be a milestone for Europe. It would also be a independent scholarly establishment for others to refer to, a reference point for Islam. Politics is the ground of compromise. In politics, principles are rarely adhered to. And when they are, it's often very pragmatic. I think that that has to be 
something that needs to change in the Muslim world, is this idea that somehow blowing up Israeli buses with civilians on it is an acceptable form of resistance. It's insane, and it's creating more harm for the Palestinians than it is good. It's alienating a lot of people with a great deal of goodwill towards the Palestinians. And I think most of the people in this room probably are quite sympathetic with the Palestinians, and that is such a deep issue in the Muslim world, and it's problematic for a number of reasons, and notwithstanding the collective guilt that Europe has in their treatment of the Jews in history, which was abominable, and also because of the immense influence and, I mean, a great deal of work that the Jewish community has put in in America. And I personally think that the Palestinian issue will not be resolved until the American Jewish community really recognizes how untenable the situation and that it just simply has to change. I really believe it's going to come from the American Jewish community because I feel that the anti-Semitism uh, that will continue to emerge as a result of the, the lack of resolution of that problem is in the end going to be very, very um, harmful for the Jewish community in both Europe and in the United States. Uh, I personally don't believe any form of terrorizing of civilians. I believe every religious tradition and every secular tradition has the idea of the just use of force. In a famous martial manual from China written by a, a Chinese philosopher, it's known as Wen Su, he said there are only five reasons for, for fighting. The first is a just reason. The second is a response. The third is anger. The fourth is greed. And the fifth is pride. These are the only reasons that human beings actually fight. And he said that when powerful people defend weak people from violent people, that is just. When a people defend themselves from aggression, that is response. When a people fight out of a sense of being wronged and pettiness, that is anger. When they fight desiring others' land and wealth, that is greed. And when they fight to display their vast superiority in military matters in order to terrorize or frighten rival states, that is pride. He said each one of those has a corresponding effect. The effect of people who fight for just cause is that leadership emerges. In other words, it brings the best out of a people, and, and you will see true leadership emerge. He said the result of response is victory. The result of anger is defeat. The result of greed is death. And the result of pride is annihilation. And this is consistent with Arnold Toynbee's conclusion that every single state that ever came to destruction came to destruction ultimately because of what the Greeks called overweening pride, hubris. The idea of saying that there's no passivism. I mean, even the Buddhists say that the bodhisattva that is tolerant in the presence of evil, while evil flourishes, is not a bodhisattva but a devil. So even Buddhism, which is a, is a pacifistic, irenic tradition, recognize that there are times to legitimately use force. And every state is only a state because it has coercive power. A state that has no coercive power is not a state. It's simply not. So coercive power is a force in the world that is meant to be used for good and for justice. And that is the meaning of jihad. And, and the Quran distinguishes between harb, which is war, and jihad, which is just struggle. It's struggle against yourself and it's struggle against wrongs in the society, either through the tongue. And our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said the highest jihad was to speak the truth in the presence of unjust authority. I mean, that was the highest jihad. So jihad in no way means holy war. War is never holy. Killing people is not holy. But sometimes uh, it is necessary in order for a greater good. And that is why the Quran says, Al-fitnatu akbaru min al-qatri. Persecution is worse than killing. In other words, when people are being persecuted, then other people are sanctioned to defend them by repelling the people that are persecuting them. And so I think 
That is, is certainly the, 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 the meaning of jihad and the meaning of just war in Christian theory as well. Because St. Augustine, even though Christ said, he who takes up lives by the sword shall die by the sword, he also said, he who doesn't have a sword, let him sell his garment to purchase a sword. Those are both in the New Testament. And they were interpreted and understood to mean that there is a time uh, for the sword. But those who live by the sword, as my country is doing so now, will eventually perish by the sword. And so I'm actually really concerned about the United States because it is my country and my children are Americans. And I think that the militancy of that country and the attempt to revive in the U.S. population this attraction to war. I mean, all these films now, the Alamo. I mean, the Alamo is about Mexicans massacring American heroes. And in a time when the Mexicans are one of the most significant populations in the United States. I mean, it seemed very odd to, to bring out this glorification uh, to kind of instill in Americans a hatred. And at the same time, Samuel Huntington, who wrote the famous Clash of Civilizations book, has his new book, is about uh, the real threat to America is no longer Islam, is not China, it's Mexicans. And this is an article in Foreign Policy called Jose Can You See? which is about the Mexican invasion of America, which is, by the way, something I recognized many years ago and decided to marry a, a Mexican woman uh, just in preparation. So, <laughs> And he claimed that they're breeding in ways that no other immigrant community have bred. And, I mean, these are just blatantly racist remarks, and it amazes me that social scientists can get away with these things in the dress of academic objectivity. And, and I'm really... I'm, I'm Distress also the fact, you know, that Le Pen was here because I think there are a lot of simple people uh, in the countryside here. I was very impressed to learn that sheep outnumber Welsh people by four to one. You know, I wanted to tell you that our Prophet Muhammad said that sheep people were clement people by nature. They, you know, they were forbearing. And I won't tell you what he said about beef eaters. What would you define as a civilization? I personally believe that civilization is one thing. I don't believe that there are multiple civilizations. I don't believe civilizations can clash because I really believe that civilization is one force. And I believe a clash of civilizations is an oxymoronic statement because I, I don't believe civilizations can clash. I think it's actually a collapse of civilizations that causes people to clash. And I think that when people are civilized, they solve their problems through diplomatic means, through conflict resolution rather than through the barbarity of warfare. I really think that that, in essence, civilization is that force that makes us human, that makes us able to live with one another. And my overwhelming experience on this planet, and I think most of you are old enough to share this with me, has been that the vast majority of human beings that I've ever met traveling all over the world and living in several places has been that they are benevolent by nature. I really believe that. I believe that most people out there are benevolent by nature. And I think if you don't aggress on people, if you treat them with dignity and respect, they tend to reciprocate. And likewise, if you treat them with disrespect and in an undignified manner, they tend to feel resentment. Aristotle said all of animosity is based on a sense of feeling slighted. And so I think there's a lot of people out there that do feel slighted. I would define civilization simply as, as that force in the world that enables us to aspire to the best of ourselves in arts and our crafts and our literature in our religion, all of these aspects that we want to preserve and protect and that are very fragile and can be lost quite easily. And finally, what advantages would a seminary bring to Wales? There's a seminary here that's up for sale. It's a Christian seminary. It's in the middle of Cardiff. And I read the plaque, and it said that this seminary is dedicated to the spreading of piety and knowledge. And I think piety is a word that, it's a beautiful English word, and it relates simply to a type of reverence that one feels towards the sacred, towards the noumenal. And that reverence, in a sense, engenders a sense of gratitude. And so you walk with a type of humility in the world and look to your fellow human beings as guests of God also, that we're all here, irrespective of whether I'm a Muslim or not. As a religious person, I view each one of you as unique creatures of God and therefore guests of God on a place that I have no right 
to say that you don't have a right to be here. And I think this type of religious attitude is always a misunderstanding of religion, and that needs to be corrected within our youth. And I think many, of, many Muslims, do not, they're not even aware that the concept of turn the other cheek is in the Qur'an. I mean, you would be surprised at how few Muslims are actually aware of that concept, and yet it's one of the highest ideals in the Qur'an. It's a Christian ideal. The forgiving Christ is the Christ that Islam honors. We also believe in the return of Christ in the end of time. And whether that returning is a returning of those principles that Christ brought into the world, which is love those that revile you, to turn the other cheek, to forgive those that wrong you. I mean, if, if that's what's going to return, it certainly seems to me like that is what needs to return to this planet. Because the Torah, the idea of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, I think if we apply that like Gandhi said, we would have a toothless and a blind world. And I just don't think that that's the type of world we want to live in. So I really feel that a seminary would be an important start for educating Muslim leaders in this country. And I really hope that as Welsh people, those of you that are Welsh and those of you that are living in Wales, that I really hope that you recognize that instead of being obsessed with creating some kind of economic powerhouse, I really think that you should see yourselves as the people that gave the world the sign for equal. And I really think that you can, can be people that actually spread that symbol and realize that symbol in your own society and become a model society, become teachers of the rest of the world. I think that you do have that potential in you. And I really hope to see that in my lifetime, that, that Wales becomes known as a model community, a community that really embodies the best of the principles of our civilization, those highest principles of these inalienable rights, things like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you very much. I really appreciate all of your presence here. I really feel honored just to have been able to address you, and I hope it's been beneficial.